It's been a good week. It's been a good uh, day of worship together. I've been blessed, encouraged by singing these songs and praying, and, and I know that you have too. <clears throat> Had a good week last week. I was convicted by the lesson last week about how to love my neighbor. We had a great week with a very talented young man and his family. Uh, the staff took Dustin out on Wednesday and had a good lunch with him. Uh, Thursday evening, Cindy and I had a wonderful dinner with them and their kids. We're looking forward to working with Dustin and Amanda and their kids. They're great people, and they're going to do great work with us as we work together. I want to have prayer with you before we begin our lesson today. Let's go to our Father. <clears throat> Father, we love you. We need you. We beseech you, Father, on our behalf that you will be merciful to us. We pray that your spirit will fill us and that you will do great things through this congregation. Father, we pray for Dustin and Amanda as they come here. We pray that you'll bless and strengthen them. We pray that you'll work through them and through all of us to do great things together. Father, we want to pray especially this week for our sister Betty Donaldson, who's going in this week for knee surgery, knee replacement. Uh, we love her humor, and we love the joy and encouragement that she brings, and we pray, Father, that you'll take care of her. We also <clears throat> would ask you, Father, to put your hand on our brother Bill Simpson, continue to be with him, bless him, encourage him, uh, bless Marilyn as she cares for him. Please be with Sister Jackie Turner as she continues her battle with cancer, and Father, with so many others that are in our hearts. Bless us today as we listen to your word, Father. May we be convicted by it. May it make us better. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, we live in a, a Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat world, and everybody is saying, look what I'm doing now, and look how many likes I've got on this, that, and the other. Uh, what's a like? I think that means somebody clicked a little thumb or something. I don't know what it means. A like. There's a like. <clears throat> look how many likes I've got. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about hidden people today. I want, to, I want to shout out to so many of you who are not in the limelight all the time, who are not out front all the time, who are doing thousands of good, quiet things all the time that are serving others and doing the will of God. That, that's who this lesson is about today. Um, uh, I want to tell you about a little bitty bald-headed guy that's about this high, and he's got glasses, and he's probably about my age, and he lives in Denver, and you'll see him at the back of the auditorium taking care of things, or you'll see him running around doing things for other people. His name's Wayne Nelson, and if you were to talk to the people of that congregation that does work all over the world, and Wayne's picture is hardly ever up on anything, they would tell you that the wind beneath their wings is that little bald-headed guy. He's got a wife that's been very sick that he's tried to take care of and do the Lord's work. Uh, he's very quiet. He's very loving. All the students there, he, he's always encouraging them. He's always building them up, everybody else. He's one of those people I'm trying to talk about today, the little bald-headed Wayne Nelsons of the world that are the wind under other people's wings. You know, Jesus liked unsung heroes the best. In fact, Jesus uses them in the body of Christ to no end. These are all the toes in the body of Christ. These are all the thumbs in the bodies of, the body of Christ. These are the noses in the body of Christ, the feet of the body of Christ. They are often the heart of the body of Christ, and many times they're the bones in the body of Christ. They do things. They do thousands of little things that seem inconsequential, but they're good things. And they make like life better for other people, and they glorify God. In Matthew 6, verse 1, Jesus said, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. As Paul was preaching to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, he says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. In Matthew chapter 6, this passage up on the screen, Jesus talked about praying 
And I, I really appreciated the humble, sweet prayer of G.H. Herder, who's one of those good people I'm talking about, see? But I appreciated his prayer, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that Brother G.H. could be found praying other times than up here. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate you people out there who pray every day in your closet for the work of the Lord and for the people of the Lord, and, and that's so good. And, and there are those that give, and Jesus said they give in front of everybody so that they may be seen of men, but there's so many of you who give in a thousand little ways and you help people in little ways that nobody sees. Thank you for doing that because that means everything in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> James and John were good men. They were uh, disciples of Jesus and they were apostles and they had to grow like the rest of us. But they wanted glory. They wanted recognition. In uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 35... James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you expect Jesus to do for you if you love him, if you follow him, if you give your life to him? Do you want him to bring you fame? Do you want him to bring you notoriety? Do you want him to bring you wealth? Do you want him to bring you power? What do you want me to do for you? Do you want him to bring you inner peace? Do you want him to reconcile you to your God? Do you want him to give you purpose in life, hope in life? What do you want him to do for you? In verse 37, it says, They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. These two young men wanted to be exalted above their brothers. They wanted to have more friends than all of their brothers. They wanted more likes than all of their brothers. They wanted to stand out over their brothers. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Because see, through the eyes of God, when God looks down upon us, God sees those things so differently than we do. God looks at things so differently than we do. And that's why Jesus said, you don't really know what you're asking if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Can you drink the cup that I drink? He was talking about the cup of his suffering. Remember in the garden when he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. That's the cup Jesus was talking about. Can you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? In the book of Luke, he said, oh, I'm so uh, straightened and, and concerned that I have this baptism to be baptized with, and I wish it was over with. Jesus wasn't talking about being baptized in the Jordan. Jesus was talking about the baptism of his struggle and his suffering to do the will of God when it was difficult. Can you do this? They didn't have a clue what Jesus was saying to them. We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, well, you will indeed drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with because Jesus could look down the road. He could see past Pentecost. He could see past Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. He could see Peter hanging upside down and Paul being beheaded. He could see Thomas being boiled in oil. He could see all of that. And he said, yes, eventually you'll drink the cup and you'll be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But he said, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. We're going to look up one day in judgment, and some little lady will be sitting on the right hand, and Wayne Nelson will be sitting on the left hand in the kingdom of heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, Paul said, We make it our aim to be pleasing unto him. There's no higher aim on God's green earth than to be pleasing unto God in the little moments of every day. Great honor in God's sight is for servants. Paul said again, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. In verse 41, when the ten heard about this, that is, they heard that James and John wanted to be exalted above them. They became indignant with James and John. The ten were jealous. They were angry. 
And jealousy and angry tears people apart. It's the works of the flesh. It gives the devil a foothold. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But you know those that are truly great in God's kingdom do not lord it over other people. They do not impose their will on other people. You know as, I, as well as I do that we can't force anybody to do anything that they do not want to do. And good leadership is good teaching and good example that causes people to want to do the will of God in their own heart. And that's what really good uh, authority is in the eyes of the kingdom of God. Verse 43. He said, it's not going to be like this with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Greatness is found in what many of you do that nobody ever sees. And that is serving God and serving others in quiet ways. Jesus came to serve. It says so in that last verse there. Jesus came to give. It says so right up there. Do you want to serve Do you want to give? Do you want to live your life thinking about the needs of others and not just yourself? I want you to consider with me for just a very few moments some of the hidden people, the little people, who did great things for God in the Bible. Now I'm going to tell you who those are, Brandon. He asked me in the foyer. Abigail's courage and example kept David from doing terrible sin and probably ruining his reputation as a king, when he was about to become king. There were those days when David was hiding from King Saul, and those those dry, grayish, rocky, brushy hills of of the desert of southern Judea. I can just see the the wadi of En Gedi in my mind, and those bleached hills, and those, those caves, and the place where David was in 1 Samuel 25 when this story went down. And there was this shepherd in the area. He's a big guy that had a lot of sheep. His name was Nabal. And Nabal was mean and he was bitter and he wasn't a friend to anybody. And David's men had been up in those mountains and the shepherds had been up in those mountains. And for weeks and weeks, maybe months and months, David's men had been pr- protecting his shepherds for no cost. And David sent word to Nabal. He said, look, our, my men are starving. I could use just a few supplies and everything. And not only did Nabal say no, he said blank no and put some, some asterisk behind it. And he said, I'm not giving you a thing. And, and he was very mean and he was very ugly and he was very insulting to David. Well, he caught David at a down moment. And David, like other human beings do sometimes, got angry about it. And David told his men, he said, put your swords on, we're going to war. And he proceeded to ride toward Nabal's headquarters through those mountains, and he was going to show Nabal what for. But this quiet woman, she's not in the annals of biblical history as some great person. This quiet woman, a servant told her what her husband had done, and she was embarrassed for her husband, as many of you probably are for your husband's. You know, but she was embarrassed for her husband and she went to the servants and she said, get some donkeys and throw some, some dried dates on there and throw some bread on there and throw some this and that and the other supplies on there and let's go. And so she rode out with some of her servants and she found David and his men coming and she got off her donkey and she fell down on her face before David. David was so angry he could spit nails And she told David, she said, you don't want to do this. You don't want to act like you're about to act. You're a good man. You're a godly man. You don't want to to lower yourself to this kind of sin and ruin your reputation in Israel. And she was so good and she was so right. And David knew that she was right because he did have a good heart. And in uh, 1 Samuel 25, verse 32, David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. He didn't know her from Adam, but this was a gracious woman. This was a courageous woman. This was a woman who spoke up at the right time. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day, from avenging myself with my own hands. An unknown lady, a simple act of giving, an act of humility, an act of honesty, 
was used by God to keep David from ruining his reputation when he was about to become king of Israel. She was one of the little people, one of the great people in the reign of God. In the days of sinful Israel, Elisha was a true prophet of God. And there was a little Israelite slave girl who had been taken by the, the, the Syrians. The Syrians and the Israelis were often at war. And she was taken probably in a raid sometime. And she was a servant, a slave, if you want to be honest, in the house of uh, Naaman, the Syrian general. Naaman was a leper. And leprosy was a terrible disease. And Naaman was suffering from it and needing help. And this little servant girl, I don't know how old she was. She could have been 12 or 14 or whatever. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I think of Syria, and I think of the Golan Heights up there, and I can see it in my mind over there in Syria, and they're still lobbing artillery shells from, the Gol- uh, from Syria into the Golan Heights in Israel. But uh, this little Israelite girl up there in Syria, she told her mistress, Naaman's wife, there's a prophet of God over there in Israel. I mean a prophet of the true God, and this prophet, he can help my master, if my master will just go to him. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 2, the Bible says, Now bands of raiders from Syria had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife, and she said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, that was the capital of Israel, he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went to his master and told him, what the girl from Israel said. A little girl from Israel spoke up for God at the right moment. A little girl from Israel changed the course of events in that part of the world at that moment because she spoke up for God. The power of a quiet suggestion from one lady to another The power of saying, I know you've really had a hard time lately. Why don't you come with me to ladies class? I think you'll be really encouraged. I know you haven't had any friends lately. Why don't you come with me to family night on Wednesday night and meet some people that will encourage you? I know that you've been struggling with something in your family. Why don't you come talk to our minister or come talk to a counselor or something like that? that will help you. Just speaking up in small ways for God at the right time, that's huge. And many of you do that all the time. Never disparage it. What about Dorcas who quietly helped the poor and the widows in Jaffa? Jaffa is a little seacoast town, a north central Israel that looks out toward the Mediterranean Sea. There were a bunch of people in Jaffa that were overlooked people. They were orphans that many people didn't care about. They were widows that many people didn't care about. And there was a lady, and she was looking after those widows and orphans in a quiet way. You know, in Acts 6, the widows were overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Widows get overlooked a lot. There's a bunch of great widows in the kingdom of heaven. They get overlooked a lot. But this Dorcas was making clothes for them. She was doing little things for them. She was taking care of them. And then she died. And when she died, there was like a hole in the church in Jaffa. It was like a great place of healing and help that was no longer there. And they missed her so much, even though they may have overlooked her many times when she was living. They missed her so much when she was gone because she was so good in so many ways. Her impact on the lives of these forgotten people was huge. And so they called Peter down there, and and he raised her from the dead. And in uh, Acts 9, verse 36, it says, In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. It means gazelle. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. And all the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. All the widows stood around crying. Folks, there are women right here, women who are good, godly women that you never see on Facebook and you never see uh, on Snapchat and you never see in the news, and they're doing good things. They're doing kind things. They're helping people that are struggling, and they're great in the kingdom 
of heaven. And I, I salute you today, all of you who are that way. <clears throat> are you healthy or are you sick? Did you know that many times uh, healthy people who have always been healthy look down on sick people? Did you know that that's true? Do you know that healthy people often judge sick people by healthy people's standards? Do you know that that's true? Well, I want to tell you about a guy that was sick. And his name was Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians. And he wasn't a great person that's going to be on the head, uh, headlines of the news. You know, you're not going to read about him. But Paul was in prison. And Paul needed some supplies. And he wasn't going to be a great missionary or a great preacher. But Paul needed some supplies. So the guy... Epaphroditus, he went and he took some supplies to Paul in prison and risked his life in doing so because he thought, I'm sure, something like, what can I do? You know, what am I good for? What, what can I do to contribute in the kingdom of God? I know what I can do. I can take some supplies to a man that's changing the world by his preaching and nobody may ever know my name, but I can take some supplies to him. Look what Paul wrote about him in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. <clears throat> he said, I think it is necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, my co-worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. What was Epaphroditus' uh, purpose? Just to take care of Paul's needs. For he, Epaphroditus, longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and he almost died. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him. And when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Watch verse 29. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him. Honor people like him. Like what, Paul? Like earlier in that chapter, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who even though he was in the very form of God, did not count being equal with God something to be held on to, but emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. Be like Philippians 2 verse 4. Look not each of you to your own interests, but each of you also to the interests of others and have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Kudos to all you Epaphroditus's out there for all the little sweet things you do that nobody knows about and are great in the kingdom. Philemon Refresh the hearts of the saints. <clears throat> I really did love Dustin's sermon last week and was very convicted by it. But in Philemon's verse 7, as he pointed out, the Philemon was like Wayne Nelson. He was always encouraging the hearts of the saints. He was always building people up. He's not on the who's who necessarily of the scriptures. Uh, there's a young man that has actually preached here before. He now lives in Denver. His name is Corey Sawyers. He's got three little boys. Corey is an awesome encourager. He refreshes people's hearts everywhere he goes. And um, he's like Philemon. Some of you are like that. In a thousand ways in the background, shout out to you today. <clears throat> Even when he was rejected, John Mark kept on preaching. John Mark. Y'all know who he is? Theory says he's the one that wrote the gospel of Mark, though we don't know that for positive. John Mark had gone out with Paul and uh, Barnabas in the Galatian mission. And when he had gotten on the sea journey to Pamphylia, he had bailed out on him. I don't know what the problem was. I don't know if he was immature I don't know if he was scared to go up into the plateau of, of Galatia. I don't know if, if uh, he just wasn't getting along. I don't know what it was. It doesn't make any difference what it was. <clears throat> he was Barnabas' cousin or nephew, and he left him, and he sailed away. Well, Paul was a pretty stern, straight-laced guy, and Paul said, I'm done with him. I want people that will go with me that I can depend on. And in Acts 15, verse 37 through 40, they were going to, Paul and Barnabas, they were going to go back and check on these people up in the area of Turkey, which we would call Galatia back then under the Black Sea. 
And he was wanting to take, uh, Barnabas was wanting to take John Mark again. Maybe Barnabas thought John Mark had grown and improved and Paul wouldn't have anything of it. He was like, I'm not going to go out there again and try to be dependent on that boy and that boy leave us again. I'm not having that. <clears throat> Barnabas was like, but you got to see what he can be and you got to be a mentor and you got to see what this young man can grow into. And so Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement and they split up. And uh, Barnabas took John Mark and they went to the island of Crete. And we don't know what all wonderful mission work they did that we don't hear about in the Bible. But Paul took Silas <clears throat> and he has the press in the Bible. I'm not running Paul down. Paul was a great man. But we need to give people a second chance. We need to give people a third chance. We need to give people a fourth chance. We need to stick with people and see the potential, potential in people and encourage people when they fall and, and lift them up again. But you know what happened when Paul was old and about to die in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11? Go to that next one, Tommy. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul writes and he says, get Mark. Get that boy that I used to think nothing of. Get that boy that's grown up to become something. Get that boy that I gave up on. And you didn't get that boy and bring him to, to me because he's very useful to me in ministry. <clears throat> there are many John Marks in the world. They're out there doing things we, they, where they don't make a lot of noise. Uh, I've helped train a bunch of them. There's Dale Kastner who doesn't get much press out in Malawi in Africa. He's a farmer from Oklahoma. He's doing fantastic work, which most people won't hear about. There's Anton Fred Fredrickson up in the mountains of Colorado. He's a simple guy that's plodding along, and he just keeps on doing the Lord's will no matter what happens. There's Dustin Rocha out in uh, Nebraska, just moved to Warland, Wyoming. Great guy. There's Jesse LeMay out in Kansas. There's DeAndre Hensley out in eastern Kentucky. There's Troy Woolery down in Oklahoma. There's Matt Threlfall. All these guys, they're John Marks. They're not <clears throat> on the top of the class. They're not the most shiny. They're not the ones that are going to have the most likes on Facebook. But they're great in the kingdom of heaven. Shout out to all those guys who are doing good things that nobody sees. What about you, you quiet women, you solid, quiet men, you who serve others, you who give to others, you who help us all? Look at Hebrews 6.10. This is encouraging. God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and you still minister. God sees you. God feels your giving heart. God loves your servant soul. God sees how you're trying. God is pleased with what you are doing. So how many likes do you get? Well, you may not get all the likes, but you've got a big, fat, capital L, capital I, capital K, and capital E from the God of heaven. <clears throat> The God of heaven's got a button up there, I guess, if it's the computer age, and he's got a humongous thumb on it, and he sees your quiet service, and he goes, boom, like, I am pleased with you. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 17 and 18, this verse is convicting to me. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. May we hear the word of God this morning. Thank you, all you quiet servants who are the wind under the wings of the people who try to do the Lord's will every day. God bless you for your service. We hope that if you're here today and if you need to respond to the invitation, you will feel free to do so. If we can pray with you, if you need to obey the gospel, come as we stand together and as we sing.